Welcome to the world of economics learners. I, Dr. Ritu Gupta, will be taking you today through economic planning in India. What we will learn in this is about what planning is, identify the need for planning, what have been the main objectives of planning, the strategy of planning in India, the new economic policy 1991, and targets, achievements, and shortcomings of planning in India. So ready, let's begin then and understand about India. India is a vast country with multiple problems faced by its population. The British ruled the country for nearly two centuries and exploited its resources for their benefit, leaving the country reeling under absolute poverty. When the British left India in 1947, there was nothing to be proud of or be happy except for the freedom. The freedom that we achieved after 200 years of struggle. The problems were many before the Indian government. Hence, those taking the reins of the Indian economy had to decide how to make India sustain and progress. Planning for growth was resorted to. Economic planning in India. Now, what is economic planning? Let us understand. Economic planning is a process involving various steps. These are, first and foremost, preparing a list of the problems facing the economy. Secondly, rearranging the list on the basis of priority. The top priority issue which needs to be addressed immediately should be placed at number one and so on. The third step is to identify the problems which are to be solved in the immediate short run and the other problems which are to be addressed over the long period. The fourth step is fixing a target to achieve the desired goal. The target could be a specified time period within which the problem must be solved. If the problem is to be addressed over long run, then it must be made clear that how many of the problem be solved in the first period, say a year or six months and so on. Secondly, the target should be a certain quantity to be achieved. Say, in case of production, the government can fix some target in terms of quantity. The fifth step is to estimate the amount of resources needed for achieving the target. Resources include financial resources, human resources, physical resource, etc. The sixth step is mobilizing the resources. This means that the planners must know the sources of arranging the required resources. For example, in case of financing the plan, the planners must make the budget and spell out the different sources of funding. When the government makes plan, one of its major source of getting funds is the tax revenue. The seventh step after having arranged the resources is implementation and execution process in an organized manner to achieve the desired goal. And finally, the eighth step is to evaluate the performance and know the difference between the targets and actual achievements. Recommendations for future plans are made on this basis. Just let us revise quickly the steps in economic planning. Number one, list of the problems to be made. Number two, determining the priority. Number three, determining the time period to achieve these. Number four, fixing the target in a quantity form as well as with respect to the time period. Fifth, knowing the resources required. Sixth, mobilizing the resources. Seven, implementation and execution of the plan and eighth, evaluation and suggestions. So this goes for steps in economic planning. Let us now understand how economic planning has progressed in India. India adopted a system of democratic planning on socialistic pattern to address its various socio-economic problems. You are already aware of the problems of Indian economy at the time of its independence. 
These problems are to be solved over a long period. Indian government adopted five-year development plans starting from the first five-year plan in 1951. The idea was to make a list of important problems to be solved, keeping in view the given resources and the capacity to arrange the resources. What have been the objectives of planning in India? The various objectives of economic planning in India are drawn keeping in view its socio-economic problems. Accordingly, the objectives are as follows. First, economic growth. Second, increase in employment. Third, reduction in inequality of income. Fourth, reduction in poverty. Fifth, modernization of the economy. And sixth, ensuring social justice and equality. Let us now take each one of them individually. The first, which is economic growth. The objective of achieving economic growth implies that the real national income and per capita income must grow every year at a targeted rate. Real national income is the measure of national income at a given year's price or at a constant price. Real per capita income is the average real income of individuals in the economy. The second objective has been to have an increase in employment. Employment refers to engagement of the labor force in gainful economic activity such as production of goods and services. Income is generated through the production process where the production process involves employment of factors of production provided by the households. You must recall that factors of production include land, labor, capital and organization or what we call as entrepreneurship. All these are owned by households which are provided by them and then they are used for further production. The third objective is reduction in inequality of income. India is a country with diverse economic standards of its population. This means that in terms of income level, India lacks uniformity. A large section of India's population belong to lower income group and termed as poor, whereas a very few are very rich with very high levels of income. Income disparity is definitely a major concern of the planners. From a social angle, women are the worst affected in terms of income standard irrespective of their caste or religion. The fourth objective has been reduction in poverty. At the time of independence, more than 50% of India's population was poor. By the year 2014, nearly 27% of India's population was under poverty as per our government's estimates. Poverty, let us recall, is measured on the basis of poverty line which is calculated as money income required to provide each person in a family with minimum desirable nutrition. Do you remember this nutrition standard? Yes, it has been fixed as 2,400 kilocalories in rural areas and 2,100 kilocalories in urban areas. Let us now understand the fifth objective, which is modernization of the economy. India has been a country of continuous exploitation by foreign powers, such as the Mughals, who ruled for more than 200 years, and the British who also ruled the country for nearly 200 years more. The British in particular left the country in dire poverty and under development when they handed over power to the Indian government in 1947. The sixth objective is ensuring social justice and equity. Indian planning also aims at achieving a socialistic pattern of society. 
it can be achieved by ensuring social justice and equity to its population. In fact, all the objectives said above are necessary to achieve this one objective of social justice. So if we achieve the first five, we automatically achieve the sixth objective. Let us now understand the need for planning. A major part of the question about need for planning has been answered in the meaning of planning itself as we have discussed this earlier. Planning involves various steps for effective implementation and execution while the number of problems facing the Indian economy are too many. Each problem is complex in nature and cannot be solved in a short period. It needs a large amount of time and resources. For example, take the problem of poverty. There is no one method by which this problem can be solved immediately. The government must collect data to know the number of people affected by poverty and the nature of poverty. We need to understand the strategy for planning. What does this strategy mean? The strategy of planning. It means the exact manner by which we will tackle the problem. By strategy, we mean the use of correct approach or method or formula for achieving the target under planning. In the first plan period of 1951-56, to 56, no specific strategy was adopted during this time. The government of India gave more emphasis to agriculture, keeping in view the fact that majority of India's population depended on agriculture and there was the immediate issue of adequate food grain supply to address the food shortage. But was this enough? No. Later, it was realized that the Indian economy was to grow at a fast pace. And for this, P.C. Mahalanobis, a well-known economist and planner, suggested the strategy of rapid industrialization. Hence, rapid industrialization was resorted to. What has been the justification for the strategy of industrialization? India's population has been over-dependent on agriculture, resulting in crowding of rural areas, pressure on land, fragmentation of landholding, underemployment and unemployment with fixed amount of land available for cultivation. More population makes the amount of per capita availability of land very small or nearly nil. The second justification of industrialization is that industries generate more jobs than agricultural activities. So industrialization will overcome unemployment. The third justification for industrialization is necessary for the growth of agriculture itself. That is, industrialization is necessary for the growth of agriculture itself. Industries use raw materials from agriculture and agriculture needs industrial equipment and machinery such as pump set, tractors, electricity, etc. So both are interdependent. The fourth justification is that establishment of basic and heavy industries must be given priority within industrialization. Examples of basic and heavy industries are iron and steel, aluminium, heavy chemicals, heavy electrical, etc. These are capital goods industries and we all know that capital goods are needed for growth in the short as well as the long run. Besides heavy and basic industries, Indian government has also placed emphasis on developing the micro, small and medium industries. These industries are defined on the basis of investment limit and can be established by private individuals. Say an investment of 5 crores or more make an industry a large scale industry and so on. 
what has been the achievement during each of the plans to understand that we first need to understand how many plan periods have gone by the five year plans we have had so far as the slide shows have been 12 already with the years given next to it we can make out that we are just about to finish the 12th five year plan and we are on the anvil of the 13th five year plan which is to begin from April 2017. To understand the Indian economy, we also need to understand the new economic policy. What exactly has been the new economic policy? The heavy industry strategy was implemented under the ownership and management of the public sector. The government made budgetary provisions for the public sector to create infrastructure and establish industries. However, the progress was slow. Even though the public sector was given the reins of the economy, especially the reins of the industries, they were not able to perform. And whatever we have recorded so far as terms of growth in industries has been largely due to the private sector. With losses from many public sector units and emerging labor problems and increasing unemployment, the country was not developing. And so, in 1991, a new economic policy resolution was implemented. What are the features or the various policies under the new economic policy? As we can see, the new economic policy had a three-pronged attack or implementation, liberalization, privatization and globalization of the economy. Popularly, it is also known as the LPG policy of the government. Let us now understand each of these terms individually. So what is meant by liberalization? Liberalization means withdrawal of controls and regulations by the government on establishment and running of industries in the country. Till 1991, all the public sector units were practically under the government even if they were called autonomous bodies. There were lots of interventions by the ministries of the government in the functioning of the public sector. What does privatization imply? Privatization implies opening up of the door of industrial activities to the private sector, which was exclusively reserved for public sector only, except nuclear, energy and defense. Since basic and heavy industries were strictly under public sector, there was no room for competition. The quality of product and services deteriorated due to lack of competition from other companies. As a result, Indian industries did suffer. So privatization means opening up of the economy to private sector. Let us now understand globalization. Globalization is a process in which attempts are made by different countries in the world to allow free flow of goods and services, labor, technology, investments, etc. India is a member of World Trade Organization or the WTO, which is the nodal agency to promote globalization or free trade between countries. In 1991, industrial policy, India adopted soft attitude towards foreign companies to do their business in India in order to promote competition. There we see the Indian economy sailing along with the world. It is now time for us to understand the successes and failures of economic planning. What have been our major achievements? And later on, we will also discuss what have been the drawbacks. 
As we all know that economic planning in India was started in 1951. There were certain objectives of economic planning which include achieving economic growth in terms of increase in real national and per capita income, increase in the level of employment, removal of inequality in the distribution of income, removal of poverty, ensuring social justice and economic justice, and modernization of the economy, etc. Let us understand these achievements in terms of certain goals that we had set forth. The first has been the achievement in economic growth. To achieve growth, it is necessary to achieve increase in national income and per capita income as well as increase in production of agricultural and industrial sector outputs. Per capita income has increased but at a slow pace of 1.2% per year. Industries have diversified and many consumer goods are now available. So per capita availability of consumer goods is quite high. The second achievement has been the creation of infrastructure. India has achieved a great deal in the area of creation of infrastructure. There has been large expansion of roads and railways. Domestic air network has also increased. And I'm sure we are all feeling the same as we move out in the economy. The third achievement is development in education. There has been a significant increase in enrollment of children at school level in number of schools, colleges and universities since independence. The fourth achievement is development of science and technology. There has been growth in technical and skilled manpower in nuclear energy and technical consultation. India's march in the space research has been noticed by the developed countries. Fifth achievement is expansion of foreign trade. Due to industrialization in the country, India's dependence on import of capital goods has declined. Many items which were imported earlier are being produced domestically. This is considerable improvement in our exports as well as in imports. And let us also understand the drawbacks. The first is failure to remove poverty and inequality completely. Yes, there has been a decline, but still poverty and inequality exist. Even after more than 60 years of planning, India has not been able to remove poverty completely. More than 240 million people are still under absolute poverty, according to official estimates. The situation is worse in rural areas. Many anti-poverty measures are there, but they have not been successful. The second drawback or failure of planning has been the problem of unemployment still persists. In spite of growth in income and output, India's employment situation has not improved much. Due to faster growth of population and labor force, the situation has worsened further. India's unemployment rate is 6.6%, which is considered to be quite high. The third drawback of failure of planning has been the failure to curtail corruption and black money. Existence of rampant corruption in various public offices is a matter of grave concern in India. Common person faces a lot of problem in getting things done without giving bribe. In fact, corruption has become a major political issue in elections as well. So here goes for successes and failures. Let us quickly go through what we have learned about planning in India in this session. We firstly understood what is planning. Secondly, we identified the need for planning. Thirdly, what have been the main objectives of planning, understood that. Then we understood the strategy of planning in India, which has been to develop industries in India. Then the onset of the new economic policy in 1991. We have discussed achievements and shortcomings of planning in India in terms of the targets. I hope 
you have thoroughly enjoyed this topic and will be able to fare well in any exam that you appear for regarding the Indian economy. Thank you and all the best. Dr. Ritu Gupta wishes you good luck and goodbye.